The title that I've titled the message today is The Gospel of Grace. And it's going to be interesting because right now I'm going to read the Ten Commandments to us. <laughs> Amen. But chapter 20, and it says there, And God spoke all these words, saying, Now this is after he's come down on the mountain, and he's uh, basically answering them. Uh, he, he, he challenged the people and he said to them, Can you do all that I have commanded you, you to do? And uh, some of the guys will say there that the way they answered was almost arrogantly. Yeah, sure, whatever you say, we can do it. And uh, basically, God then came down, and immediately his, his tone changes. And so as we read in, in, in chapter 20 from verse 1, and it says, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which has brought thee out of the land of Egypt, and out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or in the earth beneath or uh, that is in the water underneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I am the Lord thy God and I am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and the fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will, will not hold him guiltless that takest his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, nor shall thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy maidservant, nor uh, their manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor your cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Verse 12. Honor your father and your mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God has given thee. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his maid's manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the, of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. Amen. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your faces, that ye sin not. And the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. And the Lord said unto Moses, Thus thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, Ye have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. Ye shall not make with me gods of silver, neither shall ye make gods of gold. An altar of earth shalt thou make unto me, and thou shalt sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings and thy peace offerings. Thy sheep and in, ah, well, let me say that. thy sheep and thine oxen in all places where I record my name, I will come unto thee, and I will bless thee. And if thou wilt make me an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it of hewn stone. For if thou lift it up a tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. Neither shall thou go up by the steps unto mine altar, that thy nakedness be discovered thereon. Amen. And so we see God giving them the Ten Commandments. And basically the Ten Commandments, we can uh, 
add into the total of the whole, which is the law of Moses. God gave them a, a total of 613 laws altogether, which we call the Old Covenant or the Law of Moses. Now, I believe in dispensations, and I know not everybody believes in dispensations. And a dispensation is basically a period of time where God deals with people differently. Uh, in the Garden of Eden, before the fall, we call that the dispensation of innocence. They had not sinned. There was nothing between Adam and Eve and God. And so God approached them on that basis. As soon as Adam and Eve sinned, they were expelled from the garden, right? And we see that that becomes what I think uh, the memory says, the age of conscience. And then we go through all of this. We see Abraham. And Abraham, uh, God makes a covenant with him. A covenant we call the covenant of promise, which is a covenant of grace. It's the promise that Jesus is going to come and redeem our lives. And we see God deals with Abraham favorably. Even when Abraham sins, he, he, you know, he comes out of his sin blessed. Amen? So we see there's a covenant of grace there. But we see here that things start to change. As soon as the Israelites say, whatever you tell us to do, we can do. Now all of a sudden, we're... Abraham approached God because he believed in the promise of God and it was basically the goodness and the grace of God. All of a sudden, we see that man has to approach God in his strength and in his ability. And so all of a sudden, God says, if that's the way, then, you know, all of a sudden you get back. If, if you're going to approach me on your strength and on your goodness, things are going to be different. There's going to be consequences. And as I was sharing with Steve, it's very interesting. When Moses comes down on the first Pentecost with the tablets of stone, 3,000 people die on the first Pentecost, the giving of the law. But on the Pentecost where the Holy Spirit is given, 3,000 people get saved. The ministry of death and the ministry of life. Amen. And so we want to know how the law, how the Ten Commandments applies to us today. Because we see what's going on in the world. We see what's going on in churches. And, and, you know, the temptation is, well, we need the law. We need the law in the church. We need, we need rules. We need regulations. You know, people need to, you know, ah, you know, get right with God and everything like that. And then you'll have people who will say, you know, we are not under the law. We're under grace. Right? And then you'll have some will say, well, we're under grace, but parts of the law... We don't follow anymore, but we keep the moral law. So they'll say, no, we don't keep ceremonial law anymore. We don't uh, keep the dietary law, but we follow the moral law. And so we want to know which is right. Amen. Which aspect is right. And so I want you to know, and, and this is a statement here, that God does not want us to have the law today. He does not want us to, to follow after the law or be led of the law today. And that can be a contradiction to us because we think, but surely, I, 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 you know, I mustn't commit adultery. You know, I mustn't uh, take the name of God in vain. So how does this all work if I'm not supposed to uh, be under the law? Amen. And I'm glad you asked that because I'm going to try and answer it. <laughs> Galatians chapter 3. We're going to see what the Apostle Paul said when the, the, the Galatians were, were basically going to go back to the law. And, and we're going to read a lot of uh, scripture. But this is Paul's answer to the Galatians when they were trying to bring, bring the law back into the church. And he says, O foolish Galatians. 3, chapter 3. Sorry. My apologies. Chapter 3. Verse 1, he says, O foolish Galatians, <coughs> excuse me, who has bewitched you? He's almost saying to them, as somebody put a curse on you. And he says, that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth as crucified among you. This only I want to learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law, by your own effort? Or did you receive the Holy Spirit by the hearing of faith? 
And so he's challenging them in this. He's saying, did you receive the grace of God? Did you receive the gift of God? Did you receive your new birth through what you did? Or did you receive it by hearing the gospel and receiving it by faith? Amen. Then he says there, are you so foolish? That's strong talking. That's strong words, which means that to him this is serious. This is very serious. Where he says, having begun now in the spirit, you are now made perfect in the flesh. And this is the important thing to realize, is that one, we are totally reliant on Jesus. And the other basically wants to put a, uh, a pull and a dependence on our ability, on our strength to approach God. And so we cannot have a mixture in the church. Amen. God wants His church to flow by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Amen. To get a little almost Calvinist there, which we're not. Uh, but, you know, that's the truth. We flow by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Not of any work, not of any effort. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. We know that scripture, which says that you are saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves. Even the faith that you believe in the grace is given to you. And he says, it is a gift from God, not of yourselves, lest any man should boast. Amen? Yeah. Amen. So, why did he give the law? Why did he give the law? Why did God give the law? And I want you to know that the law, and this is going to be an interesting statement. Did you know the law was never meant to be kept? The law was never meant to be kept. Amen. The law was given basically to show God's absolute standard of perfection that He requires from us if we want to approach Him on the merit of our own goodness. I'll read that again. The law was given to show God's absolute standard of perfection that He requires from us if we want to approach Him on the merit of our own goodness. Amen. And this is impossible. How many of you know that without the other 603 laws, just the Ten Commandments, we've, we've all, but probably in our, in our past lives, with, when the day's not even out, we've messed up in something. We've either told a little lie, or some girl has walked past you, you know, or what have you. And uh, something has happened where you have, in some way, shape, or form, somebody offended you, and you, oh, I hate that person, which basically the Bible says, you know, is murder. You've committed murder in your heart. We've done something where we've messed up. And so obviously we know that the Lord knew that and He set up a sacrificial system in the Old Covenant because He knew before the day was out people were going to mess up. But it shows us, and this is the point, it, it shows us our need for a Savior. And so I want us to go to Galatians uh, again from verse 19. And this is going to give us the reason. I've, I've mentioned them, but this is, this is Paul writing. And he says there, verse 19, Wherefore then serveth the law? And he says, It was added because of transgressions. In other words, the law was there to amplify or show you your sins. You know, so that if you wanted to think, I'm going to approach God in my own goodness... Because many times, you, if you've seen these evangelists on the street, they'll go out and go ask somebody, well, you know, should you go to heaven? And people go, well, I'm a good person, you know, I haven't really killed any puppies lately or anything like that and what have you. And, and people will say, well, generally think, speaking, I'm a good person. Because they base it on their standard of what is good and bad. And so what some of these guys like uh, Ray Comfort will do is says, well, have you ever lied? And you go, uh, yeah. Have you ever stolen anything? Doesn't matter how big or how small. And people go, uh, yeah. And he says, have you ever committed adultery in your heart? He goes, uh, yeah. And he says, oh, so by your own admission, you're a lying, thieving, adulterer at heart. You know? And he says, you've, you've basically uh, messed up in those aspects and you are deserving of punishment because of that. Amen. So he points that out to them. And so that's what the law does. It points to you your transgression. It points to you your fault. The problem is it can never transform you. Amen. So, 
It was added because of transgressions until when? Until the seed should come. Jesus should come to whom the promise was made. Amen. That covenant of promise that Abraham had was a covenant about Jesus. Amen. It was a promise of the seed that was to come. Amen. And the, the Bible even says there that when Abraham cut the animals in half, that God put him into a sleep. And it says there that the smoky furnace and the fire, what was it, the, cloud, the pillar of cloud and the, the, the fiery furnace went through the, 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 the animals that were cut. And it was basically God the Father through Abraham making a covenant with God the Son for the promise. And Abraham basically was just the, uh, he was the sleeping partner in all of this. But what happened was, it's the, I could have read it, but uh, anyway. Uh, what, what pretty much what God did was he made a covenant between himself, God the Father, and God the Son. Two eternal, uh, unchangeable forces, if you want to call it that, that cannot break the covenant. Because God the Father is not going to break the covenant, and God the Son is not going to break the covenant. And so we enter in to that covenant. And I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. But verse 20 of Galatians chapter 3, it says, Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. And it says then, verse 21, Is the law then against the promise of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. And what he's saying, and, and the Apostle Paul covers that in various other areas as well, he says there that the law is good, the law is perfect, the law is righteous, but it can never produce uh, goodness, perfectness, righteousness in our lives because the weak part is our ability to keep the law. The failing, the falling down part is our flesh. Amen. And then he says there, uh, verse 22, but the scripture has concluded that all are under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Verse 23, and here's the important part. This is why I said the law was never meant to be kept, but it was to point you to a savior. Verse 23, but before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster, or our teacher to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. <coughs> Verse 25. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Amen? So when we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are no longer under law. Amen? Amen. And you might say, well, Still, Mike, how uh, am I supposed to, you know, because I'm not supposed to commit adultery. I'm not supposed to do all these things. So how does this then work? And I'm going to get there. Amen. Now, Paul says, and this is an amazing thing, in, in Galatians, when you read through Galatians, he says that the law is bondage. He says it's a bondage. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, he says that it is the ministry of condemnation and death. And that, that is like, you know, it can probably upset some people. Amen. But you, you can say, well, well Mike, we, we need the law. Surely we need these rules to keep us on the straight and narrow. You know, we need to hear all these things. And I want you to go to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2 and verse 11. And it says there, For the grace of God... That bringer salvation has appeared to all men. Amen. And then verse 12. Here's the thing. What is the grace doing? It is teaching us that uh, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. Amen. And so one of the things God is saying, His grace will teach us how to live right. Remember, Abraham, right? Abraham was alive 400 years before the law, and he walked right with God, right? He didn't have the Ten Commandments, but yet he was a friend of God. He walked with God. His great-grandson Joseph, right, who God raised up 
to be basically almost like a, a type of Jesus, a savior of the world in Egypt. He walked with God. Amen. And when Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him, what did he say? I cannot do this against God. Right? He, he rejected God. Oh, he rejected Potiphar's approach because of the goodness of God in his life. And so we see he didn't have the law, but yet still his relationship with God revealed to him that that was totally off limits. That was wrong. Amen. Amen. And so, we can approach God based either on our goodness and our effort and our strength, or we can approach God through the perfect, sinless goodness of Jesus. I know which I'm going to choose, right? We know Jesus lived a sinless life. He fulfilled the righteous requirement of the law for us. And then he went to the cross and became the payment, the propitiation for our sins. Our sin was put on him, right? And that's the picture of the lamb. Remember when, the, when the, uh, somebody sinned, I would bring a lamb to the high priest in the old covenant. And what the high priest would do, he wouldn't even look at me. He would look at the lamb and say, okay, the lamb is spotless and clean. And then he would say, okay, put your hands on the lamb and you transfer all of your sin onto this lamb. And then all of the purity and the cleanness and the righteousness of this lamb is going to be transferred to you. And when that happens, then the lamb is killed. Amen? Because blood is the, is the, is the price of sin. Right? The price, the penalty for sin is death. And so that lamb, that innocent lamb, is now become sin with my sin. And I have become righteous with its righteousness. And that is the picture of what Jesus did for us. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. My sin was transferred to Him. My fallen nature, my everything that was wrong with me from Adam's fall in the garden. Everything that I did. Because we're not just looking at my actions. We're looking at my nature. Right? Because from Adam's fall, my nature was this. Uh, I bear Adam's distorted fallen nature. Every single one of us do. But when Jesus went to the cross, He took that upon Himself. He became sin. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, says He became sin with our sin so that we might become righteous with His righteousness. There was a change of identity. There was a transformation. Amen. 1 Corinthians 15 says, We no longer bear the image of the man of the dust. We now bear the image of the heavenly man. Amen. So we receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. And as I said, we now have a new nature within us. We have a new nature. You see, you could say, oh, I've got my righteousness nature and I've got my sin nature. No, you don't. If you've been born again, your old nature is gone. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Amen? All things, behold, all things have been made new. And you can say, Mike, but then why do I still do the wrong stuff? Have you, you know, have you got a flesh or have you cast it out? We've still got a flesh. Amen? And, and the thing is, uh, what we need to realize is that when we walk in the Spirit, we will naturally do the right thing. Amen? And I'm going to get into that here. But you still have a flesh. And I can put it this way, and I've, I've probably used this, and it is a bit corny, uh, but if, if you were a cat, right, and all of you, you lived as a cat, and then all of a sudden God supernaturally transforms you and He turns you into a dog, what are you? You're a dog. But what happens if I still have some cat behaviors, right? Does that mean I'm not a dog anymore? No. You're just a dog, but you've got some bad behaviors that you need to correct by God's grace. Amen? Does that make sense? So we, when, we, when God has made us new on the inside, we might still have some behaviors that reflect our old man. But that's where God says when we come to Him, when we allow the Word to renew our minds, we will then reveal. The more we renew our mind, the more we reveal this new creation reality that is on the inside. And we, the more we allow the if you want to call your mind or your soul the tap that opens up this flow of this new life 
the more you align up this with the reality that God has created in here, the more this life gets to flow out. Amen. And so, just because we still have some bad behaviors, right? It doesn't mean you're not the righteousness of God. From the day you and I got born again, right? That's as righteous and as holy as you're ever going to be. The very day you receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, that is as righteous and as holy as you'll ever be. Now, we can walk in that to certain things, right? You can walk in it and you can uh, basically uh, see more of it. The more you focus your mind on walking with the Lord, the more you allow God to transform your, your mind and renew your mind, the more you are going to see that holiness and that uh, righteousness flow in your life. But just because you don't see it, right, it doesn't mean you're not righteous. Remember, when you were a sinner and uh, you, you used to do a lot of good things, remember, it never made you right with God, right? Because it couldn't transform your fallen state. So now when Jesus has saved you and He's transformed you into the righteousness of God, He's made you a new creation, if you do something wrong, does that change who you are in Him? It can't. If, if, what, if, what, if, if when you did good when you were fallen, man, right? If when you were still a sinner before you received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you could do good and you could devote your life for good, but it never made you right with God, right? But now, when Jesus has made you the righteousness of God, when He has transformed your life, if you do something wrong, it does not take away from what He has done for you, what He has made you. And we think, well, does that give us then license to sin or do something? No, it doesn't. Because the, what we've already said, that very grace teaches us to live right. It teaches us to live holy. You know, and uh, I was listening to one theolo- uh, guy, you know, he's talking about a, a British theologian. I can't remember his name. And he was saying, you know, when he reads Romans and he sees what they were accusing Paul of, because they were saying, oh, Paul is saying we can sin, that grace can abound. You know, and he said, what, what gospel was Paul preaching? Because uh, we don't get accused of that. And this was this theologian's commentary. He says, we're not being accused of that. He said, so what was Paul preaching that he was accused of saying, oh, we can sin so that grace can abound? And it was this message of the goodness and the grace of God that you are no longer under law, but under grace. Amen. Amen. So you have a new nature. Ephesians 4.24 and this is uh, Paul again saying to us, uh, you know, to put on this new man. In verse uh, Ephesians 4.24, he says, And ye put on the new man, which after God, or is made in the likeness of God, is created in righteousness and true holiness. When you were born again, God recreated you in righteousness and true holiness. And if you live out of this nature, if you live out of this, what will it produce in your life? It will produce righteousness and true holiness. Amen. The NLT, the New Living Translation says, Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and truly holy. And so he is saying to us, you have this new life in you. You have the new birth. Now take this new birth and put it on. Wear it. Wear this new, this, uh, this new life. Uh, and then he says, uh, well, I'm going to get to Romans 6. But the old you is dead, and the new you is walking in the newness of life. Let's go to Romans chapter 6. Verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Because that's what he was accused of, of saying. It goes, verse 2, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? You see, your old man is dead. Right? Your old man is dead. You now walk in the newness of life. He says, verse 3, Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death. Therefore, we are buried with Him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up uh, from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so 
we should walk in the newness of life. We walk in this new life. Amen? For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Say, I am dead to sin. Amen. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Say, I have passed from death to life. But, amen. Death has no more dominion over me. Amen. For in that he died, verse 10, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he lives unto God. Verse 11, likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 12, now he's telling you that you have a choice here. He's saying, but, but don't. He says you can, but don't. That's not right. He says, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Verse 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Why will sin not have dominion over you? Because you are not under the law. You are under grace. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 56. You don't have to go there. I'm going to read it to you, but if you want to. Uh, it says there, the sting of death is sin. Right? Sin is the poison that kills you to death. If I can put it that way. The sting of death is sin. And then it says there, and the strength of sin is the law. Think about that. The strength of sin is the law. He just said, sin will not have dominion over you because you are not under the law. And here he is saying that the strength of sin is the law. So how do I take strength, this, the, the sin's strength away? How do I take uh, sin's strength away? Eh? Take away the law. There you go. Take away the law. Remove the law. And you remove the power of sin in your life. Because one of the things that, that human nature is, as soon as you set a rule or you set a standard, amen, you're bound to fail because you're going to do it in your own effort. Amen. One of the things I learned, and, and, and I really struggled with, because I, I struggle to stop smoking. Right? And I've shared this before. But the more I focused on not smoking, the more I wanted to smoke. And, and that is basically this thing that is in us. That the more we focus on rules and not doing this and not doing this, the more you want to. And so God says, if I can get rid of the, the rules and I can put a new nature and a new life within you, you will, and you walk according to this new life, and new, new life and new nature, you will naturally not do the wrong thing. Amen. And so... He, he takes away the law to destroy the power of sin. Romans chapter 7. And I'm, I'm reading a lot of verse, but the scripture speaks for itself. Amen. He says, Know ye not, brothers, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. Amen. And he's just said, you're dead to the law. But anyway. Uh, let me not get distracted. Verse 2. For the woman which has a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he lives. <coughs> Excuse me. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband lives, she be married to another, uh, another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from the law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Verse 4. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also become dead to the law 
by the body of Christ that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that you should bring forth fruit unto God. Amen. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of our sins, which were by the Lord, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law. Amen. That being dead, uh, being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. And some people say, well, Mike, that's just dietary law. You know, that's just the ceremonial law. It's not the big ten. But let's read on. Uh, verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. No. I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known that uh, I had not known lust, except the law said, Thou shalt not covet. That's one of the Ten Commandments. Amen? So he is, he is basically telling you that by the Ten Commandments, uh, you know, you are knowing this, and this is what he's talking about here. But he said, By sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concuspicence. I hope I pronounced that right. For without the law, what? Without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin taking occasion by the law, or by the commandment, deceived me, and it slew, slew me. Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear to be sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual. And here's the problem. The law is spiritual. But I am carnal, sold under sin. And so we see that the, the reason the law cannot produce life in us is because of our flesh. We cannot do it in our own strength and in our own ability. Amen. Amen. I hope you're getting something here. Our next thing I want us to just consider is mixture in our lives. Beware of mixture. That we don't mix uh, grace and self-effort or legalism into our relationship with God. Amen. There's, you know, we, 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 we live in a world today where, uh, you know, we have to work to get stuff. We have to do something to earn something. And so sometimes that behavior, that attitude can, can trickle over into our relationship with God. Where we think, well, I fasted today, so that makes me a little bit more right with God. You know, it doesn't. Now you can, now is there anything wrong with fasting? No. But it doesn't make you more right with God. Amen? The blood of Jesus is enough. But we can fall into a trap where I've read 10 chapters today. You know, God, that, that's got to earn me something. You know? Or I've done this or I've done that. And so we start looking at little things we do. Or maybe we even get the sense and the devil start accusing you. Well, look, you, you haven't really spent time with God. You know, you're, you're not right with God. You know, you're not this or you're not that or you're not good enough and all of these seeds <coughs> excuse me that the enemy would want to plant in your heart to to make you think you've got to do something more to just get that little bit more right with God yeah Jesus has made you right but if you want to get that little bit more right you know do something a little extra you know read 10 chapters a day you know pray and then you're going to be right with God you know it's which is a lie we should be doing those things but not because it's going to make us more right with God but just because, hey, you've got this awesome privilege now in Jesus to fellowship with the Father with no shame, with no guilt, with no condemnation. You can fellowship. The Bible says in Hebrews 4, we can boldly approach the throne of grace and receive from Him. Amen. Amen. And so we must not have a mindset that says that, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to do this and then I'm going to... Make, it's going to make me a bit uh, more right with God. 
We can do things where we draw closer to God. Amen? But it doesn't make you more right with God, if that makes sense. Amen. Amen. So how do we walk right without keeping the law? The question I asked right in the beginning. Galatians 5. Amen. And I'll, I'll close with this. Verse 16. Galatians 5, 16. Then I say, this I'll say then. Walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. And so that is the answer. Have a relationship with God. Have intimacy with God. Have fellowship with God. Walk with Him. Do the do's and you won't do the don'ts. Amen? It's, and, and many times we can get to the point where I'm going to try hard not to fulfill the lust of the flesh and then I'll be able to walk in the Spirit. And that's the opposite. He says, no, just walk in the Spirit and you won't do the things of the flesh. Amen? He says, for the flesh lusteth against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another that you cannot do the things you would. And so he's saying, look, you've got a flesh, right? And we know the flesh, it wants food, it wants sex, and it wants comfort. It, your flesh doesn't have a conscience, right? And so sometimes you'll have a craving for sugar, you'll have a this, you'll have a that. And he's saying, that will war against the spirit in your life. But he's, he's saying, if you walk according to the spirit, you'll be able to put those things down. You'll be able to bring your body under control. Amen. Now, if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, you can say, well, Mike, how do I know if I'm in the flesh or if I'm in the Spirit? And Paul lists it for you. He says, you want to know if you're in the flesh? Let me tell you. The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idol idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, Variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and, and the such like. Of which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Amen. So he tells you what the flesh, the, the fruits of the flesh is. He tells you what the works of the flesh is. And then he says, how do I know if you're in the spirit? He says, yes, the fruit of abiding in the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, it is joy, it is peace, it is long-suffering, it is gentleness, it is goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. And he says, against such there is no law. The Apostle John in 1 John 5 says, this is the commandment. And he talks and he says, that this commandment is not burdensome. And he says, this is a new commandment, but you've heard it before. And he says, it's the commandment of love. Why? Because love, love does no harm to his neighbor. If you, if you flow in love to your neighbor, you're not going to commit adultery against your neighbor. You're not going to hate your neighbor if you love them. You're not going to steal from them if you love them. And there, the law is fulfilled in the commandment of love. And that is done by the power and the fruit of the Spirit. Amen? And it's done by abiding. Uh, so many times people can go, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work on my patience, my long-suffering. Yes! I'm going to work on long-suffering today. And what you do is you turn it into a work. Whereas when you abide in the Spirit, it's a fruit. Right? When a tree produces fruit, all it does is the branches just hang. Right? It, it takes from the root... Right? The branches take from the root, they take the nourishment from the root, and they produce fruit. Right? We are part of the vine. We have been grafted into the vine. Amen? And we partake of the root, and as we abide in Him, the fruit comes. You see, we can turn, even that, we can turn uh, the fruit of the Spirit into a work. We can turn it into effort. But yet, when we flow in the grace of God, it just happens. It's, it's there. God produces it. Amen. And sometimes we need to uh, talk to ourselves. And, and when the flesh, is, <coughs> excuse me, the flesh is rising up, we need to go to the flesh and say, no, I won't do that. Amen. Because that is not who I am. 
And that is the thing. I don't commit adultery, not because it's a rule, because, but because that is not who I am in Christ. I am not an adulterer in Christ. I don't commit murder. Why? Because in Him, I am not a murderer. Amen? That is the nature. That is the life that is, is within me. Amen? I don't steal. Why? Because in my new nature, that is not who I am. And so when I live out of that new nature, I naturally fulfill all of these things because that is who I am. I am made in true righteousness and in true holiness. Amen. Amen. So, spend time with the Lord. Amen. It's not just singing songs to God and worshiping, but all of the time. You can have this thing where you're just fellowshipping with Lord and you're just having a, a conversation and you're just communing with Him and you're practicing His presence and you're, you're just mindful of Him all the time, that He is with you all the time. And you flow with Him. And that's how you walk in the Spirit. Your mind is set on Him. Your mind is fixed on Him. Your heart is fixed on Him. Amen. And so, I'm going to leave it there. Hopefully, you got something. I hope. I know for some of us, we've heard this all before. But it's, it's good to hear it again. Uh, as one pastor I follow uh, says, you know, repetition is one of the best teachers we have. Amen. So, if you hear it and you've heard it, you know, hear it again and rejoice in hearing it. Amen.